Okay, guys, let's uh, start off with some housekeeping. Um, if anybody's interested in PT tech work, there's a couple of uh, positions available. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give you that information. Uh, the first one is, and Ms. Lorraine sent me a, a, a couple paragraphs, so I want to make sure I do it justice. Um, Physical Therapy Works is currently accepting applications for immediate opening for PT Tech. PT Works is full service physical therapy outpatient setting that services children and adults of all ages. In addition to offering physical therapy in a more traditional outpatient clinical setting at the PT Works facility, located on 103 West Park Boulevard, Lafayette, PT Works also provides specialized physical therapy in less traditional settings, including equine horses, school facilitated physical therapy hosted at a horse barn in an aquatic therapy uh, and they do aquatic therapy. So this is pretty cool. So I'm going to give you the um, contact. You can contact Kim Gotro at 337-988-4444. Three three seven nine eight eight four 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 four, or you can email your resume at ptworks one hundred three at att dot net. ptworks one hundred three at att dot net. And if you didn't get it, just come talk to me after. I'll be happy to. And then in addition, my man Cole. And McLeod Trauma Sheffield said they're hiring three technicians at McLeod Trauma Sheffield. Um, their application process is a little different though. You're going to go to uh, Lafayette General Health Careers. So apparently, Lafayette General has like an application process website. So go to LGH Careers, choose search, and uh, Type in 2863 in the job ID to apply. So LGH Careers, type in 2863 to apply for three physical therapy technicians at the cloud Okay. All right. Um, more housekeeping. I am thinking our first test, and let me know if. You know, you're going to be out of town for university business, or you're going to have to test eventually. I typically like to give tests on Wednesdays, uh, Monday, eh, weekend, Friday, and eh, the weekend. So Wednesday is just kind of one of those, hey man, get it done. We get to review on Monday before. And uh, so I'm thinking February 5th. Wednesday, February 5th. Now keep in mind, guys, the first test is the easiest test. The second and third, it's not that the second and third, there's just more information, right? It's just more joints and more specifics in the joints. The first test is planes, axes, fetal, out of fetal. What's the difference between flexion and flex? Uh, can you identify as something is extended? It's all relative to anatomical. So it's very sagittally plane-based. Planes, axes, concepts. Um, anybody have a problem with the fifth? Okay. All right. Well, then let's pencil it down and get this party started on February fifth. Okay. All right. So what I wanted to do was try to um, clarify, or not clarify, but just the concepts of global and local referencing a little bit more and then go into some specific practice for you guys, okay? So remember, globally is fixed, right? It's a fixed reference. Another term you may or may not be familiar with is um, uh, relative and absolute. I've actually talked about that, like relative VO2, absolute VO2, one is, one is from the perspective of your body weight. It's specific to you, it's relative to you, okay? And we also have terms in biomechanics and, and engineering with angles. And we have relative angles, and we have absolute angles. 
And I want to give you an example of those and kind of how this can help you to understand what I'm trying to convey to you in terms of joint motion. So an absolute angle is based off of kind of a global reference. So in other words, an absolute angle would be here's my x, here's my zero, right, ft from the horizon. And if I'm looking at my arm as a segment, a global angle or an absolute angle would be 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, no matter if I move my shoulder or move my trunk or move my hips, it's, it, it's a global reference of my arm and the ground, or my arm and, and ground. And so global references, we use that a lot when we're like working with people. Bring your arm back. It doesn't matter how you do it, just make your arm go back, like reach back. Or here's another one for you baseball, softball people. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the term uh, overhead throw, right? Like you throw overhead or sideline? Well, the reality is, is that throwing overhead is a very globally based concept because in reality, everyone throws sideline. In other words, from a physics standpoint, having that ball release as far away from you is going to make the ball go faster. No one throws like that, okay? But it's a global base. Overhead is over the top relative to ground and gravity, not necessarily relative to your body. Okay. Same thing for quarterbacks. Um, throwing over the top means that you lean your trunk to get the ball over the top. Remember Napoleon Dynamite, how Uncle Rico threw? Right? Uncle Rico just didn't tilt his trunk. Ben Sherman just didn't tilt their trunk. So these global references are useful in talking to people, but, but they provide, uh, they, can, they can get in the way with our illusions and seeing what's actually happening in the joints themselves, okay? So again, when I, sometimes when I'm giving lectures and I'm talking to baseball coaches and I'm like, everyone throws side on and they're like, that makes no sense. And then you show still pictures and you're like, look, their hand position here is the exact same <laughs> position all over the place. It's just how you tilt your trunk. It's not that the shoulder is any different. The shoulder is the same. So that's a precedent of a relative angles. It's relative to the actual joint itself. And that's what joint motions are. Let me give you another example. If we are taught and learned that hip extension is when your leg goes back, like you just arbitrarily take a segment and say, when I see this go back, that means it's something. You will be in a lot of trouble because joints aren't just bringing something forward, back, up, down, left, right. It's a relative concept. So my point is, is that if I was in a cast where I couldn't move my left hip, if I tried, let's just pretend, right? Freeze ray. Yeah, I just went there. So I froze my left hip, put it in the cast, trying to move it, I can't. Guys, I could still make my left leg go back by pivoting about my right hip, right? So in other words, globally, you saw something change in angle but locally, it didn't change angle at my hip itself. So again, I'm trying to plant those seeds that if you've ever been introduced to joint motions by saying supination is like a soup bowl, and abduction is bringing your arms up, or this is bringing it forward, I'm not saying that can't ever be right. I'm just saying that it's not about these global references that we typically use to be introduced to joint motions. Not every abduction is going to have arms go up, <laughs> and, and, and not every extension is going to have a leg go back. Not every flexion is going to have a hip go forward or a leg go forward. Sometimes these things don't even move, but yet we still have the same joint motions because it's relative to the equilibrium cells. So here I give a couple examples of, of relative angle changes. And also, Feel free, if this helps you, to use stick figures. Stick figures are great before and afters because you can make you know, little flashcards and you can make a lot of different flashcards to help you see kind of these concepts. But we know that we have a joint called an ankle joint. I mean, technically, mm, talocoral joint if you're really trying to show off on the weekends, right? And it's made up again of the talus and the tibia and the fibula. It just, it forms like a little socket in there. And it's a hinge joint. I'm going to get into the specific types of joints, but it's a hinge joint, meaning that it can't move in there like this. It's not made for that. And we don't want it to 
move like this. We want it to stay in the socket and we only allow it to do this. Right? So my point is, is that when you think of something that can move like this, and you say, okay, I'm going to learn it where if my foot goes down, or if my foot goes away, or if my foot comes up, that's only one of many options of those relative angle changes. What I mean by that is, yeah, your foot could move, your, your lower foot, your, the talus and whatever's connected to the talus that's going along for the ride, yeah, it can move about the shin, but the shin could move about the foot. You see, where the door can only move about bourgeois, but in biomechanics, bourgeois can move about the door. That's why a lot of engineers don't like biomechanics, because it flips the script on what can move about what. Okay? So look at this example, like going up on your toes, right? Where we start here, and then we do this. Some people might see the toes not go anywhere and say, well, I didn't move my ankle because my toes didn't go up or down. And, that, and that's not, that's them holding on to a global reference and saying, no, no, I have to see my toes go up. But yet the joint itself had a change. It moved relative to what articulates those joints. So here, I would be more in a position of fetal with my feet off of the ground. Even though my toes are still on the ground, my heels are off of the ground. Remember fetal position with your feet up, fetal position with your feet down. So I'd have plantar flexion from here to there, even though my toes stayed in contact with the ground. It's a relative ankle change. It's locally referenced to the ankle itself. Okay? And if I came back down, I would have dorsiflexion. Here's an example of dorsiflexion where I move the furthest part about the closer part. Now we have terms for that, right? Distal and proximal. And what's cool about this one, proximal, is the same thing as east, west. It's all relative. In other words, when you get into your little phalanges, right, the, the little bones here, this little bone is more distal than this bone, but this bone is more distal than that bone, and this bone is more so. In other words, you can have a bone be proximal to something else and be distal to something else. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you reference what you're talking about. Okay? So look at how many different ways we can have dorsiflexion. I can have dorsiflexion with my foot off of the ground, my distal segment moving about my proximal, but I could also have dorsiflexion with my proximal segment moving about my distal. This angle change is the same from here to there versus here to there is the same change in angle because joints in our body are relative. They are not absolute. I gave this last week, but here's another example. If we could move bourgeois, or let's say for a, a more realistic example, I had a little model of bourgeois, 153B, and it's like a little dollhouse, and I can move the door, and I say, hey, when I do, let's see, when I do this, and I take the door, and I rotate it globally like this, that's opening the door, and when I rotate it the other way, that's closing. What happens is, is that we get used to learning things from the most commonly moved or the easier part. So we say open, close, open, close, open, close. But what happens is, is when I keep the door fixed and I move bourgeois, opening is actually gonna spin bourgeois the opposite direction. So my point is, is that you get so used to external rotation, internal rotation, external rotation, external rotation, moving the door, and learning it from a global reference of the door, that when I actually move bourgeois about it, your instinct is to say, oh, external rotation is to spin this way. So because he spun whatever, the other way it must be the other joint rotation. That's not true. If this is opening the door by moving the door, this would also be opening the door by moving bourgeois. This is external, this is external. How could I prove it? Last week I said, if you're having a tough time seeing these things, how would I have to move to go back home? 
have to internally rotate to go back, that's easy enough, but when I do this, I'd still have to internally rotate to go back home. It had to be external rotation. It just looks different. Okay. All right. So for your test, you are going to be responsible for a sagittal plane positions and motions in the body. And I, I do that on purpose because sagittal plane positions and motions of the body serve a common function, fetal and not fetal. They serve a commonality. Every movement or position in the sagittal plane, although independent and separate, serve a functional task of either getting you closer into a ball or getting your mass closer or getting it further away. And then we'll vary from it in different dimensions. But sagittal is always the easiest because of that commonality. Okay? So ankle joint, talus, tibia, fibula, dorsi flexion, plantar flexion. Now, in terms of communication, how do we communicate uh, these joints and these motions? Super duper simple. The first thing we do is we communicate which side we are going to be talking about. And for people that have normal function, you're either discussing the right side, the left side, or both sides. We have a term for both sides. We call it bilateral, right? Both sides. Just like the bilateral axis goes through both sides. And that's important um, for a few reasons, but your joints are independent of each other. What your right does doesn't mean your left has to do. So we can't just assume. In fact, when we get into the hips, there's going to be some ipsilateral stuff happening, some opposite stuff happening, where your left hip is going to have one type of rotation, your right hip's going to have another type of rotation. So if my job is to test you on seeing human movement, and my left hip is doing one thing or my right hip's doing the other, you can't just communicate to me that was internal and external rotation. Like we have to be able to communicate, hey, the right did this and the left did that. Okay? So the first thing you're going to do when you're communicating, when you're studying in your small groups, hopefully I always encourage you to get into small groups uh, to study and to practice, is you're going to communicate the side. Remember, we analyze joints, we analyze motion joint by joint. So before you get into flexion, extension, adduction, adduction, internal, external rotation, right, left, lateral, right, jump in, let's communicate what side of the body we're going to talk about. Then we're going to communicate which joint we're about to analyze. Right elbow, left shoulder, bilateral knees, both knees. Okay? And listen, it's redundant, but it's okay. If you say right and left shoulder, it's the same thing. It's not like I'm going to slap your wrist because you didn't say bilateral. But those are terms I'm going to use, so I'm going to make sure you know what that means. So we're going to eat the apple in little bites. Eat the apple in little bites. Also, this is meant to encourage you for your confidence. In other words, if I'm trying to get you to analyze a specific motion, isn't it easy to start off with something simple? You know how to tell me what side is the right, the right, the left. Remember, it's the person you're analyzing, not you. Cut off right shoulder, and the doctor accidentally cuts off their left, but it's my right. So when you're analyzing someone, it has to be from the position of the person who is moving. Now you can always put yourself in their shoes, right? You can always mirror or mimic. I wouldn't say mirror because that could be confusing. You can mimic them so that way you see what they see. You have empathy for their emotions. But remember, it's from the person who's being analyzed, not from the observer themselves. Your right side is your right side. The patient or the athlete their right and their left means something to them. So we identify what side. That's, that's a two-foot putt. You should get this easy. Identify the joint. We analyze motion joint by joint. I'm not saying that when I do a squat, I'm not disrespecting the knees or the hips or the trunk. All I'm going to say is I'm going to respect one joint at a time or one area at a time. I'll get to the hips and the knees later. But when we talk about a squat, that's just a functional task that's made up of a lot of different parts. And when we analyze the motions and the positions, we have to talk about the parts. 
port, by port, by port. Okay? So let's say we're going to do a squat, lower ourselves down, bring ourselves up. So I'm going to analyze joint motion joint by joint. Me, I like to start distal and work my way in. That's just me. That way I'm less likely to forget something along the way. Because the closer you get to the midline, right, the closer you get to the middle, more stuff gets hidden <laughs> with clothes. It's kind of easier to see distally. Where are my softball people at? Softball people. That's one reason, man, why it's tough to pick up that softball. There's a few biomechanical reasons. But in baseball, when we release, we're way over here. And so I worked softball for two years as an athletic trainer, man. They, they were like wizards. They like that ball would just pop out of pop out of a portal. Where'd that thing come from? Okay. So I like to start distal because to me it's easier to see things further away and then you work yourself in. Right? So again, it's building confidence. Building confidence. So let's say I'm gonna do a squat. I'm gonna lower myself down, I'm gonna bring myself up. Functionally, squat, that's just a task. And we can break that in, in the parts, right? Lower myself down, raise myself up. We analyze motion joint by joint. So the first thing I'm going to do is have an ankle conversation. I'm going to say, well, both sides did something. I don't know what they did yet, but both sides did something. Right? If, if both sides didn't do something, I would, like if, I, if my ankle stayed in anatomical position, my mask would fall back on a fall, right? So I had to have something happen there. Obviously, the joint is the ankle. I had both sides, bilateral. And now you can get into what you observed, the motion. So in other words, the actual motion, the relative rotation, okay? The relative rotation. A locally referenced rotation. That's kind of the last part. You, you, you funnel the information down to basically say, well, the ankle rotates, but it can only spin two different ways. I can either get in the field this way or get in the field that way. So my point is, at least you kind of got a 50-50 chance. You kind of got a 50-50 chance. So if I start here, roughly in a tonical position, as I lower myself down, I'm getting further away from anatomical position in a certain new position that's going to get me more in the field. In this case, my feet are on the ground. I have this type of relative change to the ankle. Remember the dorsum part of the foot, right? Getting closer to the shin. Whether it's like this or whether it's like this, it doesn't matter. So the motion that I have going down would be Bilateral ankle dorsi flexion going down. And the entire time that I'm going down, my position is dorsi flexed because it's relative to anatomical, right? Dorsi flexion is my motion, and dorsi flexed is my position. You've heard what goes up must come down, but what speeds up must slow down in the human body. Can't just keep moving forever. So I have dorsi flexion, eventually I'm gonna stop that dorsi flexion, change my direction, and have rotation the other way. What's the opposite of clockwise? Camera clockwise. What's the opposite of rotation of dorsi flexion? Plantar flexion, and vice versa. So when I start to come up, I'm going to have plantar bilateral ankle, plantar flexion. Now, up until the point that I get back to anatomical, I am still dorsi flexed. I'm still in a position of being dorsi flexed. So I can be plantar flexing and still be dorsi flexed in terms of position. Perfectly okay. You guys do it all the time on the roads. Traveling west, going east. It's okay. Now, how could I, how could I have 
plantar flexion and B, plantar flexed. What do you think? What you got? Yeah. Absolutely. So what so what functional task? Like something simple that I could accomplish that. Plantar flexion, but be plantar flexed. Yeah, absolutely. Like I probably need to do one of these, right? Go up on my toes? Yeah. So going up on your toes, reaching something for something high. Reaching something for something high. Yeah, it's all right. Going up on your toes. You have plantar flexion. It has nothing to do with your toes. The ankle and the toes are different joints, different articulations. What your toes do or do not do has nothing to do with the ankle position or motion. Elbow has nothing to do with shoulder. Wrist has nothing to do with elbow. Now, can they work together for functional tasks? Absolutely. But in terms of where they at and where they're going, It's like uh, if any of you have siblings and you try to uh, justify some kind of bad behavior. Well, my brother was like, you see, I'm not your brother, I'm not you. Every joint is independent in terms of their position and their motion. So that'd be a good example. Going up on your toes where you have plantar flexion, but now you're plantar flex. And if you come down from your toes, you have dorsiflexion. But right up until you get back to anatomical, you were still playing or flex. I'm trying to give you examples of how you can have motion and yet have be in a position that might be different word-wise from the motion. Okay? And what about something like, well, this one's pretty easy, right? So right ankle plantar flexion, like if you're pressing the gas in the car. And if you take your foot off the gas, you're going to have right ankle dorsi flexion. I don't know, anybody ever drove in England? Do they? I know they drive on the different side of the, of the road. I don't know if they use their left foot or they still use their right. So plantar flexion, right ankle plantar flexion, right ankle dorsi flexion. On the test, I know this is a lot, but on the test, if I communicate the side and the joint for you, then all I'm asking you to do is fill in the blank for the most, right? So in other words, you don't have to be redundant. If I tell you what's happening at the left knee, <laughs> then, then I'm kind of giving you the first parts, and then all you got to do is fill in, right? I'm not trying to open, I'm not trying to trick you, but if I tell you left ankle is doing what, then just knock it in, okay? All right, going back to the squat. Let's analyze the knees. Start here, anatomical position. Remember the knees are unique in that in anatomical position, the knees can kind of only go into flexion, right? They can't kind of do this, that would be a bad day. So start in anatomical position, the first thing you're gonna have is bilateral knee flexion. But I guess, you know, depending on the exercise, I mean, you could do kind of single leg, right? But, but we don't take anything out of the question. We don't put anything into the question. We just answer the question itself. So if it's, if you observe, if I can show you a picture, start, finish, the functional task of a squat, but we analyze joint motion joint by joint. What the ankles do, independent of what the knees do, independent of what the hips do. Okay? So lowering ourselves down, we're going to have bilateral knee, what? Bilateral knee. And again, here's one way to kind of look at it if you're not quite sure. Did that motion get me more into a ball or less into a ball? Like, it could be that simple. Did I get more in the field as I lowered myself down or less in the field? More. So I had bilateral knee flexion. And thus, my position is flexed. I'm in a flexed position. My knees are flexed. Coming back up, bilateral knee extension. I'm getting less and less and less in the field, more and more and more in the anatomical. So coming back up, bilateral knee extension. 
Remember, I taught you what hyper meant, right? Beyond normal range of motion. So someone might have a hyperextended knee, that meant they had extension beyond normal, hyperextended position beyond normal range of motion. Okay. What happens at the hips? Lowering myself down, are my hips getting more in the feet or less in the feet? More, so bilateral hip flexion on the way down, bilateral hip extension on the way up. Okay. Working our way chain. Let's say I was doing some crunches. I would normally do these pushes. As I bring my, again, relative term, in absolute terms, as I bring my shoulders up off the ground, wouldn't I kind of be getting more in the fetal position, more into a ball? So that's going to be trunk flexion, trunk extension. And another way to look at extension is if I start from anatomical and extend my trunk, I am further away from getting into a ball than when I started. So it's still extension. Cervical vertebra, same thing. Neck, cervical vertebra, getting into a ball. Yeah. Chin to chest, cervical flexion, cervical extension. Extended, what's hyper? Hyper, beyond. This is the one that tricks people. And I blame uh, ESPN. Your hips and your shoulders are, just, are a, the same classification of joint. They're not the same joints, but they're the same classification. What I mean by that is, if this is hip flexion, guess what? This is shoulder flexion. Extension, extension, flexion, and, and extension. So I think what happens is that when the broadcasters are doing their highlights, and, they, and the, the outfielder lays out, and they say, full extension. I think what's happening there is that they're referencing the elbow because you kind of lay it out. But the reality is, is that the elbow is probably in the same position as they were standing in the outfield. The elbow didn't. But what's the obvious motion change is the shoulder. So people in assume that the full extension is out here in the shoulder. But this is shoulder flexion. This gets you more to a wall than here. Right. Heads up! Ah. I'm going to do this. This. Okay. So that can get you. So for you, you can kind of say, hey, follow the hip. Just to remind yourself that those things kind of mirror each other. If this is hip flexion, this is going to be shoulder flexion. So on the test, I'm going to get super duper tricky and do something like this. But you come into class saying, we analyze motion joint by joint, and the right and left don't have to do the same thing. So if I start here and I do this, I'm going to say, what did my right shoulder do? As a separate question, what did my left shoulder do? My right shoulder had flexion, and my left shoulder had extension. Right shoulder flexion, left shoulder extension. And where students might miss that is by making it about you and not about the person you're observing. I know that sounds silly, but it just happens. Where you're looking at the picture, and for you, looking at me, looking at you doing this, you're like right, left, because you're making it about your right here. It has to be from the person you're observing. And, and listen, if all else fails, just imagine you're doing it. <laughs> and that way, you won't miss it. It doesn't have to be both. They don't have to do the same thing. Okay. So shoulders can help us get into a ball. Elbows can help us get into a ball. But again, I don't have to do the same thing. I could be like, and I could be really crazy and do stuff like this. I could be like,
be like, oh wait, we have last motion joint by joint, or whether the elbows do, what the shoulders do, it's all good. So if I did this and I said, what was the significant motion you observed? Well, what do you want to talk about first? Let's talk about the elbows, what the elbows do. My right elbow extended and my left elbow extended, right? In other words, I'm more in feel here than when I ended. I went from here to here from my elbow's perspective. So guess what? This to that had bilateral elbow extension. They don't have to mirror each other globally <laughs> to be doing the same thing. What did my shoulders do? Well, my left shoulder flexed. How do I know? Start, finish, left shoulder flexion. And what did my right shoulder do? Not a darn thing. And it didn't do anything if I did this. It didn't do anything. So, so you can see the temptation if you're like, I'm looking for the hand. And when the hand goes up, it's there, right? I can, I can, I can move the hand different ways that don't necessarily involve the elbow or the shoulder. Wrists can help us get in the feel. Wrist flexion, wrist extension. The easiest way to learn about the wrist is the fingers, man. Follow the fingers. Follow the fingers. Because my radial ulnar joint, as I'm going to teach you, can roll to reposition your hand. It's really important for us because we do a lot of gripping, grasping, dexterous things. We need to be able to put our fingers in a 360 degree window function. And our radial ulnar the joint does that. It kind of wraps and re wraps, repositions our fingers. The easiest way to remember fetal and out of fetal for the wrist is just follow the fingers because the fingers will always lead you to wrist flexion. Finger flexion will always lead you. And that's because the wrist joint itself doesn't spin. The radial ulnar joint spins, but the wrist doesn't spin. In other words, you can't twist your wrist. You can't do it. So that means that the fingers will always follow wrist flexion wherever you're at, radial ulnar joint position. Okay? So wrist flexion is going to get you into a ball. Finger flexion is going to get you into a ball. I'm not going to, in a 300 level class, I'm not going to get into you know, uh, distal interphalangeals and proximal interphalangeals and metacarpal phalangeals and first interphalangeals. We just say fingers, finger flexion, because it's about functional tasks into a ball. Finger flexion, wrist flexion. Okay? So, to review, you are going to be accountable for position and motion changes at the ankle, knee, hip, trunk, cervical, shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers. Now, that does not mean you're going to have to know all the different bones and all the different types of joints. This is just introduction to help us to understand why planes and axes are important to us. Okay? And it's also comforting to know that functionally it's all about getting into feet or getting out of feet. Am I getting more into a ball? Am I bringing my mass closer together? Am I bringing my mass further? Let's do some MOA, some MOA practice. Okay guys, planes and axes. Um, don't answer right away. I know that's kind of counterintuitive, but if you know these real quick, dude, that's awesome, man. But I want everyone to have a chance to kind of use their strategies to figure these things out, okay? So if you shout it out or say it quick, they may kind of, wait, I was almost there, right? So it's just giving everybody a chance to kind of get to the conclusion at their own speed, okay? First thing, you need givens, right? You need clues, you need givens. Uh, in high school physics, right? What are your givens? And you put in another storm crank. Globally reference, first question. So from a global reference, from the room's perspective, right? When I say global, that means room. If on the test, if I say global, and you raise your hand, I'm like, oh, what do you want? And you're like, does this mean the room's perspective? I'm gonna be like, oh. I'm just, I, can't, I can't answer that part, right? I can't answer those kind of questions. I can clarify questions, make sure it's saying what I wanted to say, but I can't literally answer those kind of questions. So you need to know that global is from the room's perspective, okay? 
So global perspective, what axis, this is also gonna help us remember the difference between planes and axes. What axis is this rotation? Let me do it like this so you can see the front. What axis is the CD rotation occurring about? Anterior, posterior. Yes or no? Globally, does the axis change if I make the CD spin like this? Yes. Now it becomes, it goes from an AP axis to a bilateral axis. Yeah, it's still a pin, it's still an axis, but the direction, that's literally like taking Interstate 10 and making it into I-4, you know, it's a new road. It's a whole new road. It's still a road, but it's a whole new road. Okay? What about plane, global reference? What plane is this rotation occurring in? So you notice when I say plane, it's in. You swim in a pool. <laughs> you, you rotate in a plane. You rotate about an axis. Ins and abouts. Key terms. Okay? Globally reference, what plane do you observe this rotation to be in? Don't answer right away. Give it some thought. Okay. What plane? The room's transverse. Does it matter if I bring my hands closer together or bring my hands further apart? Does that change the plane? No, absolutely not. It's still the same dimension of spin. Okay, and here's a tricky one. Global reference. Give it some thought. Plane would be frontal, good. Axis would be anterior posterior. Okay. Now, let's get out of global and get into local. On the test, when I say locally referenced or relative, it's all about your eyes. What I mean by that is if I want a perspective of a joint, I'm just going to tell you <laughs> what's happening at the ankle, at the knee. But if I say your perspective, well, there's only one thing that can kind of interpret everything for your body, and that's how you see things. It's your eye's perspective. And in that regard, your sagittal, frontal, and transverse changes as you change. In other words, walk forward. But if I was facing here, walking forward would be with it. It's relative to me, okay? So let's do those same examples, but now it's gonna be locally referenced from my perspective of planes and axes, which can move with my vision, okay? All right. What do I see? Give it some thought. What's your final answer? I see what? Transverse. I just so happen to see transverse no matter how I, I turn with my head up. That doesn't change. That doesn't have to change. So in other words, that's a good way to not get tricked. Just because I'm not facing the front of class doesn't necessarily mean that I may not see the same thing, okay? All right? How about this one? What do I see locally? What dimension do I see rotation occurring in? I see transverse. Reason being is that this, to my line of sight, is the exact same thing as this. The only thing that changed is what's in the background. My transverse. Still my transverse, still my transverse. I saw the same thing the whole time, okay? So if I saw transverse, then that must mean it must be happening about a polar axis, right? So guess what, when I do this, my polar axis also moves as well. All right? what if I did jumping jacks?
What did I see? What you got? Frontal, right? Did the room see the same thing? Yeah, we can see the same thing. We don't have to. What if I did jumping jacks like this though? Did the room and I see the same thing? And that's okay. But what we have to do is we have to communicate how we saw it differently. The room still saw frontal. But what did I see? I saw sagittal. It's always from who you're observing, right? So if I'm doing the jumping jacks and you're sitting there, <laughs> it's from my perspective. However, one of, the, one of the techniques that I've given you is that you can always put yourself, you can always have empathy and literally imagine you doing what you're observing, right? So, so if that's a technique that works for you, just say, well, instead of Dr. Campbell doing the jumping jacks, I'm gonna do the jumping jacks. What do I see? So it can be what you see if you recreate it as such. Absolutely, absolutely. Good question, and thank you for asking that question. Okay? Let me see. I want to make sure you get in, okay? This is one people commonly miss, okay? And it is the concept of do objects translate straight line move-in planes, yes or no? No. In other words, if I just drop, if I just drop the umbrella down, it moved in a, it moved in the negative Y, but it didn't necessarily spin in a dimension. Planes have to involve rotation, okay? So if I wanted this umbrella to move in a plane, I'd give it spin. Now, there was still a component of that motion that was straight, but now there was a rotational component that we say moved in a plane. So that's a common miss. On the test, I'll give you kind of this straight line. You know, I, I, I shift the chair across the room or I drop something straight down. The key thing is to remember that planes in biomechanics are specific to rotations. There has to be something spinning, okay? So if I wanted this umbrella to move in a plane, I gotta give it some spin, okay? Don't forget to sign the roll. Guys, y'all have a good day, man. Look forward to seeing y'all on Wednesday.